ഞങ്ങൾ അതിവാസ്യമായി സ്നേഹിക്കുന്ന ഞങ്ങളുടെ സ്വർഗ പിതാവ് ദൈവമേ അനുഗ്രഹിക്കപ്പെട്ട ദിവസത്തിന്റെ അന്യമായ സമയത്ത് വീണ്ടും തിരുസനിലേക്ക് ഞങ്ങൾ അടുത്തു വരും ദൈവമായ കർത്താവ് നീ ഞങ്ങൾ നൽകിയിരിക്കുന്ന അറിവിനായി ശാസ്ത്രത്തിന്റെ നല്ല അറിവുകൾക്കായി സ്തോത്രം ശാസ്ത്ര സാങ്കേതിക വിദ്യയിൽ അവിടെ നൽകിയ നല്ല കൃപകൾക്കും നല്ല മുഖകൾക്കുമായി ഞങ്ങൾ അനുഗ്രഹിച്ചിട്ടുണ്ട് കർത്താവെ അനേകരിലൂടെ മാനവ ജനതയ്ക്ക് അനുഗ്രഹമായി തീരുവാൻ ഈ ശാസ്ത്ര സാങ്കേതിക വിദ്യ അവിടെ നിന്ന് ഉപയോഗിക്കുന്നല്ലോ ഇത് ശരിയായ രീതിയിൽ മനസ്സിലാക്കുവാൻ ഇതിന്റെ ഭാഗമാകുവാൻ ഞങ്ങൾ അവിടെ ഒരുക്കുന്നതിന് നമ്മൾ സ്തോത്രം ശാസ്ത്ര പ്രകാരം കർത്താവെ ഈ ശാസ്ത്ര സാങ്കേതിക വിദ്യ മനസ്സിലാക്കുവാൻ അവിടെ നിങ്ങൾക്ക് നൽകുന്ന അനാവശ്യത്തിനായ സ്തോത്രം ലഭിക്കുന്ന ഈ അറിവുകൾ ഈ അവസരങ്ങൾ ഞങ്ങളുടെ അനുഗ്രഹത്തിന് ഞങ്ങളുടെ സഹജീവികളുടെ നന്മയ്ക്ക് പാതമാക്കി മാറു മാറ്റുവാൻ ദൈവമേ നീ ഞങ്ങളെ സഹായിക്കണം നൽകുന്ന ഞങ്ങളുടെ അഭിമാനം ജയമിന്റെ പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ഇന്ന് ക്ലാസ്സുകൾക്ക് ഡോക്ടർ കെ എൻ നൈനാൻ ദൈവങ്ങളിലേക്ക് കേൾപ്പിക്കുന്നു കർത്താവിന്റെ പ്രിയ മക്കളെ എല്ലാവർക്കും ശക്തീകരിക്കുകയും ബലപ്പെടുത്തുകയും ചെയ്യുന്നു ക്ലാസ് അറ്റൻഡ് ചെയ്യുന്ന എല്ലാ പ്രിയ മക്കൾക്കായും സ്തോത്രം അവരെ ക്ലാസ് അവരുടെ ജീവിതത്തിൽ അനുഗ്രഹമായി തീരുമാനം അവരുടെ ചുറ്റുപാടുകൾ അവരുടെ അനുഗ്രഹം ഉണ്ടാകുവാൻ നമ്മൾ അനുഗ്രഹ ചെയ്യണം അതിയുടെ അവസാനം ദൈവിക സാന്നിധ്യവും കൃപയും ഉണ്ടാകണം പ്രാർത്ഥനകളെ തിരുസ്നേ സമർപ്പിക്കും സകലവും യേശു ക്രിസ്തുന്റെ തന്നെയുള്ള നാമത്തിൽ തന്നെ ആമേ ആമേൻ ആമേൻ Can in danger make me brave make me know that no can save keep me safe by thy dear side let me in thy love abide let me in thy love abide when my heart is full of grief help me to remember thee help me most of all to know that's my father
respected attendants, invited guests, and all my dear ones who are attending from far and near. I am Liana Yohana, a pleasure student from Karikam International Public School. It is my proud privilege to welcome you all to this important meeting organized by JMM Study Center. We are having a series of space-related topics, and you all know how important a topic it is today. Today's speaker is none other than Dr. K. A. Naina, who is the former outstanding scientist in Vikram Sarabhai Space Center and a Matthias professor in Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology, Trivandrum. Dr. Nainan had his BSc, MSc, and PhD degrees from University of Kerala, securing uni university first rank for both BSc and MSc. His eminent contributions are the Madhusudan and Krishnan Nainan equation derived his team in 1986 is widely acclaimed in the field of thermal analysis. He received many awards and honors which include ISR Performance Excellence Award from President of India, Lifetime Achievement Awards and Honorary Fellowships of Indian Society of Analytical Science and High Energy Material Society of India. In 2012, he was selected as a full member of International Academy of Astronautics in Paris. Now he is a member of Governing Council in JMM Study Center and the convener of its current awareness forum. Let us look forward to a wonderful lecture about the incredible prospects of space science. I wholeheartedly welcome Dr. K. Nainan sir to this function. I would like to welcome Dr. Deepti L. Shivadas, who is leading today's Q&A section. With immense joy, I would like to welcome Reverend B.G.A. Matthew and C.B. Palachira are offering today's prayers. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Jameson Achan, who is the Associate Director of JMM Study Center to this function. I am happy to welcome our technical and media wing led by Mr. Robin Thomas and Reverend Ashes Thomas, DSMC to this function. I would like to welcome all the parents and teachers to this function. At last, but not least, I would like to welcome all the students who are attending this meeting. May I welcome all of you who are attending this function from different parts of the world. Thank you and wish you all a very fruitful section. Thank you. I am audible, I hope so. Yes, sir. So I'll start. Clear, please. A respected agents and teachers, dear students and parents, a very good evening. Recording to in progress. All of you. Thank you, Leah, for your nice words of introduction. Thank you, Reverend Dr. K. Jameson Achan. Associate Director of JMM Study Center for inviting me to deliver a lecture on Indian Space Program. Friends, ISRO or Indian Space Research Organization is rated as one of the most successful organizations in, in India, doing challenging tasks for the country. The Indian Sp Space Program is well respected world over for its great contributions to humanity. So I have chosen my Robin, where is the share? There is a download button. Download. Please look down. Yeah. 
Can you please share your screen? That green color with an arrow at the top. Oh, this one. This one, this one. Okay. Recording stopped. Yeah, okay. Now I find the sharing. I, I got it now. Recording in progress. Is it coming, the slide? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I'll go to full screen now. Okay. Yeah. It always happens. No, a little bit. Uh, don't worry about that. You know? No problems. No problem. Okay. The title of my lecture, I, as I said earlier, is Incredible Accomplishments of Indian Space Program. You know, the word incredible means unbelievable, and it has got two connotations. In positive sense, it means extraordinary, whereas in negative sense, it means impossible to believe. Malayalati Paranyare, Avishwasaniyam Nana in the translation, and it under thunder, Onna Asatharam, positive, negative Paranyal, Vishwasi can better. Well, ISRO has experienced both the situations. When ISRO started its journey, people used to say, okay, incredible. What they meant was impossible to believe your ideas. But now, after seeing what we have accomplished, like this big rocket, which weighs 640 tons, this is the size of a man compared to the rocket. Now people say incredible means extraordinary. Well, friends, behind these extraordinary accomplishments, there have been great efforts and visionary leaders during the past 57 years, starting from 1963. I have had the great fortune to be a part of this journey for 45 years. I was also fortunate to be motivated by some of the great scientific leaders of ISRO, who gave people like me from ordinary universities and colleges great confidence to strive for extraordinary results. In this lecture, therefore, I propose to share with you some of these great experiences and great accomplishments of ISRO, not in great detail, which is not possible in the limited time available. Neither I have the expertise in all these areas. But as a gist, please note that I have got now about 50 minutes to tell you 57 years of events, amazing events in space program. Therefore, I request you all to listen carefully. This is in fact, I call it as a techno motivational lecture meaning the lecture having technical details, historical aspects, and motivational aspects for this. Okay, now let us start. The content of the lecture, we will try to answer three questions, in, usually in science, why, how, and what. Why India's accomplishments are extraordinary, how they were realized, and what are the lessons we learn from them. Of course, the how part is the maximum part. So it again has got three parts in it. We started with Dr. Sarabhai's space vision, and then, you know, it was realized through our own satellites, our own satellite launch vehicles. And of course, I will be, give a glimpse of the chemical rocket propellant system, which is my area of work, and therefore I can't help telling about that. And then space services rendered by ISRO to the country and the world as a whole. Only a couple of examples. Then we will also see the initial efforts what we have initiated to realize 
the second waste uh, space vision for the 20th 21st century and finally what are the lessons we have learned from all these endeavors okay so the first part will be why india's accomplishments in space programs are amazing there are four reasons for it we had a very very humble beginning we started from a church building in tumba because tumba is near the magnetic equator you know just like uh, geographic equator earth has a magnetic equator we didn't have any office or laboratory at that time therefore this st mary magdalene church and the adjacent parsonage were used for our laboratory and offices and the very first rocket launch from uh, there was called nike apache in 1963 which is an american rocket okay then today this space this church has been converted to a beautiful space museum you can visit them uh, after the probably after the pandemic okay now there are two other reasons we are the last to enter the space arena all other countries space faring nations like usa ussr france china were at least 10 years ago of this and ours is a purely civilian program we didn't have any support from our military at that time or even now also and and also the very important thing is that we have probably the lowest budget of all space faring nation only 77.5% of nasa and 30.6% of china but despite of this today we are top in utilizing the space technology for applications of humanity so in my lecture i am going to tell you the major part of it will be how these amazing accomplishments were realized well the first step was indigenization of the sounding rocket that means we have instead of the american rocket being flown we have made it in our own laboratories and these are called rohini family of sounding rockets from small this this number stands for its diameter of the lower stage small this to the larger one it is a single stage one as well as two stage it has got a lift off mass that means at the time of lifting off from 100 kg to 1.35 tons and its payload mass payload means the instruments it carries on top of the rocket varies from 10 kg to 100 kg and it can go to an altitude of 85 to 500 kilometers above earth mainly it was used for atmospheric studies in this context i am proud to present to you a sounding rocket which we call as viom which was the rocket realized by i beat students of iast the one and only rocket realized by a students community in the country launched in 2012 from tumba equatorial rocket launching station and i was uh, the guide for this work okay now this was a picture taken in 1968 which shows the dedication of tal sumbai kutu rocket launching station to the united nations done by prime minister indira gandhi this is by pressing a button here the person standing behind is dr vikram sarabhai but dr vikram sarabhai the founder of indian space program had a vision to go much beyond indigenous sounding rockets his vision was very clear in the famous speech which he made in 1967 in the un when he said we must be second to none in application of advanced technologies like space technology to the real problems of man and society at that time people would have i am very sure they would have said incredible meaning that it is only a, a dream but then why dr sarabhai dreamed about because he had a vision of the potential of say, space technology for socio economic transformation of india by bringing the modern amenities of telecommunication education medical facilities we have fantastic facilities in the world but then they are not right now confined to major cities to remote villages where hardly any of these things are available he also realized that the satellites can space Uh, can provide 
information of all natural resources. It can save life through warning on natural resources. He also, in his wisdom, he realized that it's not a good idea to buy these services from elsewhere because, first of all, we didn't have money for that. Second thing is that it has strategic reasons. Any country can anytime say that, no, we will not give. We had such an occasions earlier also. This, his vision was because of the potential of the satellite for human development. The satellite is an eye from sky, not sky, that is for eagle, we say, but eyes from space. The eye can go up to 36,000 kilometers and above, can receive and see and receive data from the entire surface of the space within its coverage. And uh, process the data through the transport transponders inside the satellite and transmit them back to the Earth for different uses. I will give you a, a brief picture of satellite. I will not go into its detail because it's not my area of work. You know, the satellite has got essential parts are shown here. It has got antennas for communication and also command, solar cells to charge the batteries, the rechargeable batteries here then a provision to receive and transmit radio signals. And one of the areas where we have contributed is the propulsion unit. It has got a fuel tank. It's not correct to say fuel because it's a propellant tank. It has a, got a main engine which thrusts the satellite for its purpose and also side thrusters from here to steer the satellite in the space. And of course, it, it has got its own cameras. Okay. Now we'll go to the satellite. Where are they to be deployed? What is the criteria for that? That is for the next five to 10 minutes, we'll discuss about that. The satellites are deployed, what, what you call the equat equatorial orbit, that means above the equator, or the polar orbit, that means above the pole. They go from pole, pole to pole, and then there are satellites in between them in inclined orbit. This angle is called the angle of inclination or orbital inclination. Okay, the coverage of a satellite depends on the its altitude. For example, it, this, uh, please don't draw on, uh, the slide, on the slides. I request Robin to deactivate that process. Okay. Thank you. We will have a, your drawing session at the end of this class. Okay, I will give a couple of minutes for those who can draw very nicely, but don't do it right. Now. Okay, we agree. Agreed, no? Okay, very good. Okay, the satellite, coverage of the satellite depends on its altitude. altitude satellite altitude has been classified arbitrarily into what is called a low Earth orbiting satellite up to 200, 2,000 kilometer side. At that altitude, the coverage is only a few kilometers across the Earth. Whereas at 36,000 kilometers, what is called the geostationary orbit, it covers almost 40% of the Earth. Had the Earth been flat, it would have covered almost the full region. What is called the medium orbiting satellite, medium Earth orbiting satellites cover in between. Now let us take and see them one by one. Okay. The orbital parameters of these satellites in a circular orbit has been calculated. A human being had the capacity to do this calculation for over two to uh, three centuries. Now let us take the orbital parameters, namely the altitude, velocity, and the period. Period means the time taken for the satellite to make one full revolution around the Earth. Suppose you consider a moon, of course, moon goes in an elliptical orbit, consider it as equivalent of a, a circle, then it's, this is the altitude, the velocity, this is the velocity and the period. The period comes down from 20, 27 days to 95 minutes, as the altitude comes from 3,85,000 kilometers to 540 kilometers, correspondingly, the velocity increases from 1 to 7.7. .7. This is kilometer per second. No? It's, it's a kilometer per second. This is the type of the velocities. Okay, but in the case of a 
elliptical orbit, the velocity is not constant like this, the velocity will be maximum at the perigee, in this case about 10 kilometers per second. Perigee is the closest point to Earth and the minimum at the farthest point to Earth, in this case 1.5 kilometers per second. Though we were knowing how to calculate these parameters, the human beings had no ability to place a satellite weighing a few hundreds of kilograms into this orbit with this velocity till 1957. 1957, October 4, we had the historical event of the USSR Sputnik, putting Sputnik 1 in a low Earth orbit of 580 kilometers altitude using their one of their intercontinental ballistic missile. That's what I was trying to tell. All these countries had the support from their military, but we didn't have any such capability with our military at that time. Okay, now we'll go to the satellite in geostationary orbit. This is, I suppose you can see, this is the equator and it is above the equator. I'll, to be precise, exactly at 35,786 kilometers altitude with a velocity 3.1. But at this condition, it takes exactly one day to go around the Earth. What does it mean? That means the satellite would appear stationary like as you see in this picture, stationary with respect to any specific location on the Earth. And therefore, it can collect data from any part of the Earth under its coverage continuously. Continuously, that is very important for telecommunication and weather monitoring satellites like Indian National Satellite called INSAT-3, which is in the geostationary orbit. Well, because Earth is a globe, if you have got three equally spaced satellites at 120 degrees apart, then we can cover the whole surface of the Earth. But one disadvantage is that this type of, at, at such high altitude, the resolution is somewhat low. Resolution means what you can see, uh, differentiate between two objects is one kilometer. But that is good enough to find out where the cloud is formed or where, where, where the cyclonic storm is formed. Of course, before going to that, we will see, okay, how to reach the geostationary world. This is always reached through what is called a geostationary transfer orbit. The reason being, suppose you want to go from Earth against the gravity of Earth directly to 36,000 kilometers with a 2-ton uh, weighing satellite and impart the orbital velocity, then enormous amount of propellant is needed for that purpose. It is, it may not, the rocket may not lift at all. So it is taken to the geostationary orbit via a temporary elliptical orbit called geostationary transfer orbit, like this. So what is done is that the rocket or the launch vehicle takes the satellite from Earth to the perigee. I suppose you can see this, the perigee of the GTO at about 300 kilometers altitude with a necessary orbital velocity of that elliptical orbit. That is 10 kilometers per second. We have seen earlier that, you know, it, uh, the maximum velocity at uh, the perigee. So thereafter, once it is in a, in a uh, orbital velocity, the uh, satellite can go on its own. It does not need any further propulsion unit. So it goes on its own around the Earth in an elliptical orbit. But when it comes to the Apogee point at 36,000 kilometers altitude, what do we do? We fire the liquid engines in the satellite. To increase its velocity, its velocity otherwise would have been 1.5 here to 3.1 kilometer per second velocity, which is needed to go into the circular orbit. One or two firings are needed to make it a perfect circle. So this is the mechanism. You have learned how to book a satellite from Earth to a geostationary orbit. As I said earlier, the main disadvantage of the satellite, though it has got very good visibility, is that it has got 
a low resolution of one, approximately one meter. That means it cannot differentiate objects which comes within one meter of its, its visibility. For that, what we do is we have what is called a low earth orbit. As we have seen earlier, they are near 200 to 2000 kilometers with this velocity and this speed. What is the advantage? The advantage is that closer pro proximity means better visibility. That means we can see the images with high resolution. Indian remote sensing satellite, the resolution is 50 centimeters. That means it can see two people shaking hand from about, uh, about uh, 800 kilometers height using our inside satellite. But another uh, big, big advantage is that if you have a space station like International Space Station at 400 kilometers altitude, it is easier for astronauts to go up and down, and also it is easier to take the cargo from Earth to the satellite in the Leo, low Earth orbit. But then every advantage has a disadvantage. The disadvantage is that it has got a low coverage so of this trip. When it goes around the Earth, it goes in this trip only. So how to solve that problem? There are two ways of solving it. One is to have a constellation of satellites at different inclinations. A large number of satellites, they go around the Earth in different orbits to cover the global coverage. A large number of satellites are needed for this purpose. For example, there is a USA-based Iridium satellite constellation for communication using low Earth orbit satellite. They need 66 numbers of satellites at 780 kilometers orbit. Then scientists are thinking how to overcome this problem. A, a smart way has been found out by what is called the polar Earth orbiting satellite. That means the satellite goes from pole to pole as the Earth moves towards the east. So what will happen? Each successive orbit, it covers one strip, another strip, third strip like that. So the entire Earth will be covered in a day. So that is one way of doing. Only thing is that at a time it can see only within the strip. But in integrated over the whole day, it can see the entire Earth. Now, sun synchronous polar orbit is a special case of polar orbit in which the satellite is made to visit the same place at the same local time every day. What is the significance of this? In India, we may not feel about it too much, but in, 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 in the Northern Hemisphere, you know, it has the benefit of seeing the place at constant illumination by sun throughout the year. Irrespective of whether it is winter, summer, or whatever time, the illumination of the sun at that place will be constant if you place the satellite in a polar orbit. The polar orbit is achieved at above the, at an altitude of about 600 to 800 kilometers, but an inclination of 97 degree, not 90 degree, but 97 degree between equator to this. Why? What is the speciality of that? Because at this condition, the orbital plane rotates 360 degrees centigrade in one year, like this, along with the Earth's movement around the sun. That means it is synchronized to be in the same position relative to the sun. Some of you would not have understood this particular aspect. Forget about it. Uh, if anybody wants to have a little knowledge about uh, this further, we will have a discussion at the end, because it's a little too specialized in that area. Okay, all that you have to remember is that a polar sun synchronous satellite means it comes to the Earth at the same time of a day every day. That's all. How it is attained this finer detail. Okay. Now, this is very important to accumulate data on long term problems like deforestation of a rising of sea level with a high resolution like the IRS Indian Remote Sensing Satellite P5, which you see in this picture. Now, okay, you have the orbit, you have placed the satellite. Now, what is further needed? You need a rocket to place it in the uh, corresponding orbit. That is called the satellite launch vehicle is used to launch the satellite in 
at the required altitude with the required velocity. Not an easy task. How it is done? It is done by using multi-stage rocket with progressively increasing performance of each stage. For example, though I told a big sentence, it means that this rocket has got three stages, two solid strap down, a liquid, and a cryogenic stage. So what I said was that the performance of this stage increases with as it goes up in its usage. Like the solid lowest, more than that is a liquid, and the maximum performing. Performing means how much thrust it generates per unit mass of the propellant. That is the most important parameter of a rocket. OK, like in a relay race, you know, in, in my heyday, when I was a youngster, Pita, this is Pita Usha. Pita Usha was always the last one because she will make up for all deficit which is made in the, in the relay race. So like that, in a satellite launch vehicle, the best performing stage, in this case, first stage is solid, second stage is liquid, and the last stage is cryo. We'll come to this uh, in the next, next slide. Uh, OK, at the last, but there is a la major difference between the relay race and rocket race. Or satellite launch vehicle. Here the runners are uh, moving, uh, moving separately, but poor rocket, it has to carry the subsequent runner on its shoulder. All, all of them are stacked together. So what does it do? So during the flight, the spent stages, that means the stage after the propellant is consumed is discarded. Heat shield like this, this is used to protect the satellite inside from Aerodynamic heating when the rocket flies up through the dense Earth's atmosphere. This is a satellite, precious fellow, precious baby. So it is put in a shield till about 100, 120 kilometers. At that time, that is also jettisoned out. So that way, the inert mass is reduced to attain higher velocities. In this way, the rocket is designed. But then remember that each individual stages should have very high reliability. That is proven by doing what is called a ground test. Static test means without flying, it is tested on the ground. Why? The reason is that the launch vehicle can be tested in its totality only at the end of the flight, uh, only in the flight. Unlike a motor car, which can be uh, test driven or, or an aeroplane which can be test driven before the passengers are loaded. But the rocket means it is only one and only one test. That is a final flight test. So that is why the trick of the great uh, uh, skill and science and technology which is needed for making the launch vehicle. So what I saw is very clear in this particular picture. This is G uh, GSLV Mark Two, which we will see what it is later on, weighing 415 tons. It was launching a satellite which was weighing 2.2 tons into a GTO, geostationary transfer orbit, using this particular rocket. So at when this bottom first day, this performance is over, it is cut off and then allowed to fall into the sea. Then the second stage takes over. And when it comes to about 120 kilometers altitude, the heat shields are separated. Finally, the cryogenic stage works. You look at this data. Of the 10 kilometer, approximately 10 kilometer per second velocity achieved, the cryogenic stage, which weighs less than 4% of the whole satellite, that imparts 50% of the velocity to the rocket. This is what I was trying to tell you. The spent stages, these two stages are allowed to fall into predetermined point in the sea, not in an island or not on a, uh, on a of course, uh, the, uh, the ships are forbidden from travel on that day at that time. Okay, I have told you I will talk, give a small glimpse of what are the propellants. The propellants are the major constituents of a rocket not only of a rocket, but a satellite also. For example, the GSLV Mark III, which is our largest solid, uh, larger rocket made by India so far, 88% of it is the propellant. 
63% solid propellant and 22% liquid propellant. Even a satellite or a spacecraft like the Mangalyan, which went to the moon, 64% of it was the propellant. So you can understand the propellant was one of the most major ingredient and most critical ingredient of not only of rockets, but in satellites also. It is in that area which I, I was working for almost 40 years. Okay, so it imparts the momentum by ejection of hot gases, momentum to the rocket or to the satellite by hot gases to the nozzle. It's a self-contained system comprising both oxidizer and fuel in it. It is wrong to say the fuel of a rocket. It's okay if the rocket was flying only in the air, it could have absorbed, taken up some oxygen from the air and burned itself, which is what, what is happening in a jet engine. But in this kind of satellite launch vehicle, almost its entire flight is in vacuum. Therefore, it should contain its own oxidizer. Okay, it's not only used in uh, rockets, but in, uh, you have seen earlier, in satellites for orbit racing and, uh, and other, other maneuvering and for interplanetary missions as well. ISRO, we have developed a state of, a state of art that means what is contemporary in the world, both solid and liquid propellants. The solid propellant is, I will not go into detail because of the lack of availability of time. It's a solid block like this. This is the actual picture which you would not have had any opportunity to see in your lifetime because it's a very classified area of work and uh, it's a very explosive material also. It contains an oxidizer called ammonium perchlorate and a fuel which is aluminum and a polymeric fuel binder, all blended together and formed into a solid mass. Whereas in the case of a liquid propellant, the fuels and oxidizer are stored in separate vessels and it is pumped into the, uh, the required proportion to the combustion chamber where it burns and the gases gets expanded through the nozzle. There are three types of liquid propellants. One is PAKA liquid, that is called earth storable. That means they are liquid at room temperature. These are the chemicals which we use as oxidizer. Unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine and monomethyl hydrazine, these are the fuels which are used in our rockets and satellite launch vehicle. Whereas cryogenic, which has got the best performing, you have seen earlier. Cryogenic means they are liquid at very low temperature, like liquid hydrogen, which is a liquid at 20 Kelvin, and liquid oxygen. This is also used in upper stages of our launch vehicles, but not in satellites. And also a semi-cryo where liquid oxygen and hydrocarbon are the fuel. What you see in blue color are the ones which were synthesized in our laboratory, scaled up and produced in-house or externally. Okay. So that is what you have seen. Now we'll see the, uh, quickly the history and technology of development of propellants and chemical systems for Indian space program. You will not believe if you see this picture. This is where we started our development in a poor man's hut like a asbestos roof building like this. Even today we have maintained it. This was where we all, I also started working in this place under a great person, missionary leader called Dr. Vasant Govariker. He was head of the, this division. He started the research on propellants and polymers here. He is Dr. Govariker. Look at him. He is presenting a proposal to Prime Minister Indira Gandhi at a time when a tiny rocket of this size was not working. He was presenting a proposal to set up a huge plant at Sri Aurobindo. Look at his confidence because he believed in Indian youth. He believed in self-reliant India. He had a perfect faith and belief that we can do it and we did it. In his belief, as a part of the work, this is my picture. You may not believe it. Looking at my full head with full hair, now it is completely bald. You know, he has sent me to BRC for one year training, afterwards to establish a propellant testing laboratory. 
within one year of uh, coming back from BAR Sibaba Atomic Research Center, I set up that laboratory. And this is this handsome person is Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. Coming to my lab to inaugurate it, and Dr. Gosanda Goharikar is behind me. Thanks to his great vision, today we have a solid propellant plant in Sri Arikota, which can make 100, one of the largest solid propellant plants in the world, which can make 100 ton segments there. We have got our own production facility to make the polymer. We have got our own production facility to make the ammonium perchlorate oxidizer plant near Alway. It has got capacity to make 1,500 tons. We, by 1980, we have made up a state-of-the-art analytical and spectroscopy division at Vikram Saravai Space Center, and I became its founder head. In this picture, you can see Dr. Kasuri Rangan, the fifth, fourth chairman of ISRO, and behind him is Dr. Madhavan Nair, who was the director at that time, who became the chairman after him inaugurating our nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometer. Okay, yet another important personality in the rocket technology was Mr. Remarco, who established the first rocket propellant plant at Sri, uh, sorry, at uh, Tumba at Trivandrum. He was handing over the liquid propellant in a carboy, like what we used to carry the Manana today, no? To Professor Yuarao, who was a satellite uh, the project director at that time, who later became the chairman of ISRO. But today, we are handing over it in huge containers like this, made in our own plant. So thanks to these visionaries and their work, to starting from nothing, today India is 100% self-reliant in the critical technology of propellant and related materials. Just to give an interesting picture here, this picture shows one of our lab technicians by name, uh, okay. Something happened in between. It is just on by itself. Yeah, I think we are here. In 1969, this was the size of a, our rocket. Orki was pouring a particular material here. Today, this is the size of our rocket. And this is automatically done. I don't know. I suppose it, it doesn't have any any mechanism of sensing me and then changing the slides. Okay, this is where we are now. Ah, uh, yeah, this is the one. This is our rocket. Uh, today, this is the size of the rocket, the third largest the booster in the world. And you know, people are. This is a, this is the size of a man in relation to this size, whereas this is the size of a man in relation to this rocket. Likewise, we have the liquid propellants also in huge stage, 150 ton of the propellant. And this is the launch vehicles we have developed over the years. And this is the first two are what you call the developmental launch vehicles. SLV-3 and ASLV using only solid propellants. They could launch only very tiny payloads or satellites, 4,800 kilograms. But this is the real hero of India today, PSLV weighing about 300 tons using both solid and liquid. It can play satellite in polar orbit as well as in geostationary transfer orbit. And it has got the record of launching 104 nano satellite in one single launch. This is Mark II GSLV, and this is the Mark III GSLV, which weighs 640 tons as of 
now today. Okay. Today, thanks to the great visionary leaders and the following work, the dream of Dr. Sarabhai is a reality. We have our own satellites, our own launch vehicles, our own launching stations and tracking facilities. We are one among the five nations in the world having these capabilities. We have successfully built and launched 123 satellites and spacecraft. 42 space missions were there in which 342 satellites of 36 foreign countries like USA were launched from with our own launch vehicles. So that is, uh, that is the capability we have demonstrated to the world. Okay, coming to the application part of it. Coming to the application part of it. See, we have very many applications. I don't know how the, the slide got stuck. Okay. Like this, you know, agriculture, land, weather, climate, uh, and of course, tele-education, you are one of the users of that, telemedicine. That means we see a, a specialist doctor or a panel of doctors sitting in place like Bangalore or Kochi can look at a patient in far away in Assam or in Kashmir through the satellite uh, and with the help of a generalist there, get the details of him and and return, he can advise the doctor the treatment. This is a reality today. For example, in All India Institute of Medical Science, Amaranda Institute of Medical Science in Kochi, there are telemedicine hubs which serves people in Kashmir, in Assam, in Kar Nicobar Islands, and in Lakshadweep. Another one is forecasting the potential fishing zone. Looking at the sea surface temperature and the color of the ocean, it is possible to predict where the fish come together. So we give the advice to the fishermen all throughout the coastal area. Because of this, you know, there has been 50,000 crore worth of additional fish has been caught during these years ever since we started this program. In fact, the space industry has grown to such a level, such a, such a large level that today, the annual income from space industry world over is something like, you know, it is like 950, it is equivalent to India's one year of budget. We have 24 hours of weather forecasting and cyclone warning system. Like this, you know, the cyclone clouds are seen and we give timely warning to the people. Just to give an idea, 1970, November 12, there was a cyclone called Bola cyclone, which killed five lakh people in India and Bangladesh. Year before last, there was a cyclone of same intensity or even more intensity where the death was only 68. It is estimated that more than a million lives have been saved thanks to this type of satellite services. Of course, it cannot be measured in terms of the money. So after having realized Sarabhai's vision, I will have another couple of uh, slides. I will tell you about our future endeavors. It is estimated that there is an interesting periodic table made by the American Chemical Society. What is seen in red is the elements which will disappear from the earth after uh, 50 years or so, and some of them become rare. And, and then what do we do? Shall we wind up our business of development? No. So that's why people are doing. 
people are trying to do what is called i'm not touching anywhere still the slides are moving okay i don't know okay people are trying to do mining of asteroid it is estimated that one asteroid contains gold that is core which is equivalent to 1000 trillion us dollar worth of mine apart from money as stephen hawking the famous scientist said human being will be forced to find abroad elsewhere because of global warming a nuclear war or genetically engineered virus let us hope that the present one is not a genetically engineered one this is the sort of a habitat planned in mars in year 2050 by an american company called spacex company they have already made their rocket and the, the and uh, and and uh, spaceship together it weighs about uh, 4 4000 tons and then okay this uh, towards realizing this vision india has done certain work already one is what is called the space recovery experiment in 22 january 2007 a spacecraft which was moving around the earth for 7 days safely landed in bay of bengal we went to the moon in chandrayaan 1 in 2008 you know that we would have landed and uh, there was a small slip between the cup and lip in july 2019 in chandrayaan 2 and then the most historic thing according to me was our mangalyaan mission where we traveled 617 million kilometers in 300 days to reach the moon in the very first attempt and india became the only country in the world to succeed in the very first attempt and the gaganyaan mission to take the man up in the in the, the space well this success is not by an individual or by a couple of individuals in fact as many as 20 different centers have worked for it the mother center is vikram saravai space center and almost 1800 18000 people work with an annual budget shown here well friends the vision of dr saravai became a reality today through the vitality of isro vital team means hard work with passion and perseverance of those who followed and the values of isro working together for to realize a common national goal which is a rare sight anywhere professor sadish sawan materialized dr dr sarabhai's dream by building isro into a world class organization but in spite of our best efforts we had failures the worst failure the most disappointing failure not only for isro but the end their scientific community in india was the slv3 failure in 1979 instead of going into satellite going to orbit it landed in the bay of bengal none other than dr abdul kalam was the project director he would, was the most disappointed man at that time but what professor davan told us in a speech he told us he consoled by, by way telling that problem will come to only those who are working if you don't do any work no problem will come to you so you continue to work that is what he said so he brought out a new culture of working in isro in isro we search for what caused the failure and not who caused the failure as what is done in most of our government and private institutions now they will find out who has done that then mistake then firing shot him down if professor dawan has done that we would not have, we would not have had a dr uh, abdul kalam now in the country search for what caused the failure and not who caused the failure he instituted a mechanism of failure analysis board to find out the solution to the problem 
I myself was chairman of this failure analysis for chemical area for 10 years. That means if some failure happens anywhere in ISRO, it is not only the responsibility of the guy who caused failure in, in that, but the entire community find out the causes for the failure. That is what is called the failure analysis board. And he shouldered the responsibility of the failure. You would have read in uh, Wings of Fire book. When the prime minister has to be briefed, or the newsman has to be briefed. Professor Dhawan went after the failure. But after the second one, which was a success, Professor Dhawan put up Dr. Kalam to Prime Minister Indira Gandhi to explain her the success story. So, my dear friends, that was a type of confidence. Once again, you draw, you wait for a couple of minutes only, then you can draw again later on. Okay. So this is the confidence what Dr. Kalam got. But for that event, he would have gone into riches and then he would not have become the first citizen of the country now. He, that, that is why he has, he has uh, himself said, confidence and hard work is the best medicine to kill the disease called failure. It will make you a successful person. It will make you a successful person. It will give courage to explore the unknowns. From my own experience with this, I can certify for that. When there was a failure in one of the static tests here, that means this is a ground test. There was a huge discussion going on in a, in a conference hall with 100 people. Where shall we send for testing this? No facility available in the country. Shall we send to France or to US to get it done? Then I raised my hand. I would have been maybe less than 30 years at that time. Then Professor Thawan, he is Professor Thawan standing here. He asked me, I see one guy standing there. What do you want? I, I told in a, in a trembling voice, sir, there is no need of sending this abroad. I will do in my lab with my wonderful colleagues. Then he said, he said, not without consulting my boss as well as Dr. Kalam. He said, okay, let us give this man a chance. He gave me a chance and in less than 28 days we did. With that. I'm proudly telling less than 28, we did that, and Professor Dhawan is uh, reviewing our results in our laboratory. That confidence and hard work enabled us to overcome big setbacks. We had one of the greatest setbacks in the history of ISRO was the cryogenic technology denial by uh, the Russians in 1993 under the influence of the Americans. So they said, we will do, we will develop it. We will not go on begging. We will develop it ourselves and we, we did that. And this is the result of that. So we ourselves have contributed 40 special chemicals for that. This is Dr. Kalam seeing our material. These are not only small material, but huge materials like insulation tank for the cryogenic and a special pipe called polyamide pipe, which can carry a liquid at 20 Kelvin temperature. He became president at that time. He was visiting our laboratory. My dear friends, this is a concluding session for me. The lessons learned from the success story of India space program is, yes, we can. But there are some conditions for that big S. The conditions are, you should have a great dream or a vision. It should not be a dead dream. You should have proper plans and confidence to achieve it. You would have passion and perseverance to realize it with hard work. You should not be defeated by setbacks. You should learn from failures and improve upon. You should hold uphold values in your life. You see our great leaders like Dr. Sharabai. He was a Ambani at that time, but he set aside all his wealth and he dedicated his life for science and for India. Look at people, Dr. Kalam, leading a simple life and becoming from the, from the poorest of the poor family, he became the first citizen of India, thanks to this type of value system he imbibed from Israel. Yes, why I am telling, yes, you can, because yes, we did. This is our status when we started. Dr. Abdul Kalam, at that time it was Mr. Kalam, squatting on the, on the ground, on the floor, because he didn't have a chair to sit, along with another colleague, 
assembling a payload carried on a bicycle and this was our lab in a corridor between two rooms and this was sides of our rocket in 1969 when man landed on the moon this was only 7 kilograms but friends today is the size of our, our rocket we have gone one lakh times the payload has increased in 10000 times to a higher capability i will end up by showing you a beautiful launch of a rocket that is my last slide usually when this type of a launch is there there will be a big clap i believe that 200 people who are watching me are giving a clap now because it is one of the most successful launches of gslv mark 3 i think that is end of my talk and then uh, i think uh, uh, we will exit from are this okay i am visible to you or no yes we can okay. recording stopped okay do i cannot see myself it's good that if you can see me okay dr deepthi shivdas deepthi you can start hi yes, sir uh, sir thank you very much for the wonderful lecture um, it was indeed a comprehensive account of isro's accomplishment in the field of space research and you have explained it in very lucid way thank you uh there is only one question in slido.com i am not able to access that so uh so receiving message is limited to very uh, less um now the now the uh the doctor now the zoom chat is open zoom is open you, you please ask questions doesn't matter okay, whether sir. it is small or big questions yeah yes sir the first question um is uh 50 cm resolution do you mean that every 50 cm is like a pixel not that way in a picture you can differentiate object which are which are 50 cm apart for example my two eyes are say if they are not 50 cm apart if i take a picture from 90000 km altitude then you cannot differentiate these two eyes whereas if 20 cm if this is a 10 cm if the resolution is 10 cm then a picture taken from 9000 900 km altitude can see my two eyes otherwise it will see us only one head here so that is what is meant by the resolution okay yes sir uh, the second question uh, if the part of rockets get dropped into the ocean it is not getting polluted whether the ocean is uh, getting polluted or not oh no this pollution see our satellite launching or part falling into the rocket rocket parts falling into the ocean are maybe maybe about 100 numbers for all of the globe together and they are not soluble material they are made of metals and the things like that only some residual propellant will go into that that uh, compared to the volume of the ocean and compared to just to give you an idea the pollutant that goes into by all rocket stages falling into the sea in the whole year is less than what is discharged from our titanium factory in one year okay so you can understand what is the level of pollution that can be caused by this okay Yes, sir. The third question is from Abhimanyu Anand. Uh, which is the current big mission ISRO is currently focusing on? There are several big missions. One of the most popular attractive mission is uh, our uh, Gaganya. That means putting the man in a low Earth orbit. Not one man, but maybe three men in the low Earth orbit in a capsule, and. in that capsule they will go around there under the microgravity conditions for 7 days and then they will come back safely to earth that is from the point of view of uh, the uh, public appeal 
and very futurist that means about 100 years from now or 50 years from now some of you or your children may settle down in mars at that time this mission become critical otherwise towards that what is critical is what is called our uh, uh, mark 3 mission it's it has to be proven to what is called the human rate human rate thing has to be done for doing that okay then we have coming up mars mission and other continued missions are there so to to put in one answer if you take the country as a whole our 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 gaganyan mission is according to me uh, the most prestigious one the next question is from yemi there are eight planets but why we are planning to build a colony in mars oh yeah it's a very good question see you, that is two reasons that is nearest to the earth even that takes 10 months to reach there and it is the closest to the habitable condition other near one the temperature is see there the things like lead will melt that is the temperature here it is cold but then this is the nearest and also to the best of our knowledge which which is somewhat livable after a certain modifications of uh, mars mars itself need a tremendous amount of modification mars is 95% carbon dioxide atmosphere and its atmosphere is only 1 by 100 of uh, the pressure of uh, uh, the earth and its gravity is only one third we can't go and stay in moon because it does not have any atmosphere and its gravity is very low so always you will be floating around but in mars its gravity is almost one third and it has got a fairly good uh, uh, atmospheric density and also because of this gravity if we create some oxygen in that it will not diffuse and go away forever so that is the reason so other things are still further away. and still more hostile in atmospheric i'm sorry in the habitat conditions as compared to the earth okay next uh, the next question is from vivan how was the huge solid propellant plant created oh yeah that's a very good question it's a very proud question for for all of us in isro it was created with total indigenous capability except a linac machine all other machines were procured indigenously designed indigenously built indigenously all the raw materials were made indigenously the processing was done by our own methodologies it's a very hazardous process and therefore it is remote remotely done and we had to do a number of test trials and also a number of simulations because these tests are very expensive very risky so we did a number of simulations small level tests what is called static test from that we went step by step to larger and larger the final static test to the flight test and incidentally that s200 that's our the largest solid booster the third largest in the world after space shuttle and also arian that was its static test was uh, the success see our design is so robust and so good that uh, you know it has uh, it has uh, you know we have done only two ground tests before directly flight that was our conference we had whereas the americans did six and the french did seven study because we have limited money limited resources so in isro we are responsible people we see that things work at the same time optimally work with the limited funds available okay good question yes sir the next question lots of questions uh, uh, you please consolidate and uh, say one by one okay sure sir Uh, so the next question is from jeswin oman uh, how efficient are our propellants the efficiency is always compared in terms of what is its theoretical possible against what we achieve ours is around 95 to 96% efficiency the best efficient is about 97 98 so we are not far off from the best in the world okay next yes sir uh, the next question is from rohan will india conduct a mad moon mission there is right now no plan if you ask me my personal opinion i am not a, a, a policy maker in isro 
will say that it may not be a very good idea. If we can, let us go to the Mars itself. But as a learning curve, you can go to the moon. But first, we have to prove ourselves. We, can, we cannot, uh, like a child, we cannot run in the first step. First, we have to be a lower orbit in Gaganya. Then, we gain confidence. Then, maybe we will go to moon. And then, we will go to Mars. In your time, maybe the Americans are planning to have a, a colony in Mars, not in moon, in 2050, 2050. So in India, I wanted to very clearly say, when, when man went to moon, Dr. Sharabai in his famous statement in the United Nations, he said that we don't want to compete with the USA and the USSR in going to moon at that time, because there was no immediate requirement of going to the moon at that time. But today the situation has changed. As I told earlier, Earth is non-living. Earth resources are depleting, especially rare minerals and chemicals. And therefore, we have to find our abode elsewhere. We have to find our resources elsewhere. So we have to necessarily explore uh, the asteroid and planets. That's why we have undertaken. It's not for the pride of trying. Okay. Good question. I think all questions are very good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sir, the next question is from Navneet Krishna. How does ISRO do such big successful mission with a small budget? That is a very, see, that is what is called, uh, you know, there is a word in Hindi, I just forgot what does it mean. That Indians have got, ISRO has got, when we went to Mars, sorry, went to Mars orbit, with about 10 percent the cost of Americans, this question was asked. It was answered in Hindi. I forgot that word. It means that you know we have got the ability to do great things with small budget. Okay, so we did one of the major reasons why our cost was low because we have a ready PSLV rocket available. There. We didn't have to develop a special rocket for this. The, 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 the 50% of the cost would have gone into a special rocket that has to be developed. We used our own rocket. Then we used our own equipments, all the uh, seven equipments abroad, our Mars mission was made in the country. Nothing was imported. If we were to import, they would have charged 10 times. It was all done in the Indian capability. And also, our fantastic way of working, when we decided that we will have a Mars mission, 5,000 people of ISRO work for that. Whereas, look at one university, where a problem is there. I don't, I don't think no two professors will work together for solving one problem. But this is my claim. We have developed that uh, culture in our ISRO, thanks to our great leaders like Dr. Sharabai, Professor Dawa, Dr. Vasanth Govarikar, Abdul Kalam, and so on and so forth. We have learned to work for not for our fame, but for the fame and name of our country. That is how we did it. In other words, optimum design, in other words, minimal tests, and making use of what is available within the country. Okay, that is Next question. Uh, Darshil is asking, what are some difficulties faced by students during developing Vyom rocket? The students have, I see, they couldn't have done it themselves. They tried to design. But if we have flown with their design, it would, have, it would not have lifted from the, uh, from the launch pad. So first difficulty was how to design the book. When they tried to do with textbook information, it was not OK. But we had the great strength of ISRO and ISRO's design review mechanism. Incidentally, I forgot to tell you, we have a design review mechanism. Just as failure analysis board, we have a design review mechanism. Suppose you do a design, then it is not only your responsibility to so, uh, prove that it will work, but the, in, the, 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 the organization has formed a team called Design Review Team, where all the good brains come together and discuss and see whether it will work or not. If a bridge in Pala River is made to be designed, it is not only one engineer who looks at the design, but at least 20 people will look at it. That is how we work, uh, work together. 
okay for example i myself was uh, heading a design review team of solid propulsion for about 8 years so where we have looked at the uh, design of s200 and so on so what was the question oh let's so what it. was the difficulties faced by students? oh yeah difficulty okay then this design review team of isro helped our uh, students to come out with uh, a what you call a pragmatic design there are two types of design one is uh, a textbook design another one is a pragmatic design. a pragmatic design was uh, design second thing of them was in the case of uh, assembly and all those things for which isro's facilities were used and each step there were uh, people helping from isro but then i am very sure that had it not been for iast they would not have developed a, a realized a rocket of their own in fact we consider it as uh, equal to slb3 launch a, a launch of vion by iast students okay next question yes sir the next question is uh, from shreya singh what are the scientific instruments on board chandrayaan 1 i don't remember there were 14 scientific instruments one four seven were from india seven were were from abroad the most important thing two, two or three i remember i can tell you the most important thing was to find out hydroxyl radicals that means the present hydroxyl radicals come from water and uh, things related to water hydroxyl not radical hydroxyl uh, bond bonded compound in fact one of the astounding discoveries of chandrayaan 1 was the presence of huge quantity clear cut proof of huge quantity of uh, ice in the polar region uh, dr madan nair sir himself has told you in the inaugural session that is one of our discovery second one was the mapping you know that means what are the minerals available that was developed in house third one was a quarter pole mass spectrometer weighing 1 kg as against usually a mass spectrometer weighs 100 kg but this is a flight worth a mass spectrometer these are the three then there of course there was always there will be a camera to to picture them uh, okay these are the four or five i remember quickly next uh, next uh, surya kudalil she want to become a space scientist so what are the things to be done for that first of all i appreciate for it so what you should do is see in space there is nothing called pure space science, except a few the remaining things are all a conglomeration of engineering and science i am myself by training a chemist but i after 10 years i don't do chemistry work but i do propellant technology work so you do your studies properly become an engineer mechanically there are a lot of mechanical engineers electronic engineers there are chemical engineers there are physicists there are chemists there are mathematicians and all sorts of people are there but if you, when you go for masters like mtech or something like that you can definitely get into specializations like aerospace avionics which is electronics for made this thing space science where you study about atmosphere and atmospheric conditions so at this stage what you have to do is you you develop genuine interest in science look at around you and see what is not seeable by others try to collect some uh, some sort of a mental images of what is happening ask question why it is happening like this a whole scientific things evolve from the question of why why it happens how it happens then you come there sir you study well come up and go for your uh, good courses definitely you will find a place in in but whereas if you want to become an astronaut you need a special physical conditions agility and so on okay next yes sir the next question is from milan abraham uh, how far we can go with gslv rocket i told you that depends on the payload for example if the payload weighs 10 tons we can go to a lower orbit whereas if it is 3.5 tons it can go to the geostationary orbit through the geotransfer orbit whereas if its weight is very less 
we can go further and further but as i told earlier it is a frivolous frivolous means it is not a profitable exercise to go very distant places in a launch vehicle the launch vehicle is used this is an intricacy of rocketry the launch vehicle is used to overcome the gravity of the earth with the large mass thereafter it is a satellite propulsion which is used to go to the mars which is go to the moon gslv will never go to the mars gslv will never go to the moon gslv will take it only to a appropriate gtu geostationary transfer from there on it is a satellite propel because you need very small propulsive force once you overcome the earth gravity in the gtu then it is a satellite propulsion which takes you to the moon which takes you to the mars and it takes you beyond okay so the capability of the rocket is to take the huge payload into a gtu that means geostationary transfer orbit or beyond okay next Uh, i question. see that there are 73 questions but yes. uh, i may not be able to answer all you i suggest you select a few and or couple certain questions and then you put across okay sir uh, so next question is from sunny abraham uh, will isro launch spacecraft that study about jupiter and other outer planets we have we may we may do right now the plans are not there to the best of my knowledge i have left isro some eight years ago whether they they are on the drawing board stage i don't know okay next this question is from abhimanyu uh, what is the major information we have collected using mars orbiter mission mom oh that is a very good question see we were looking at methane what is the significance of methane we know that on the earth i see even though when i was a young boy or younger than most of you guys every day there was a news in malayalam or our madhubhumi telling that the other day we saw some guys using a telescope walking around the sun there was a uh, river flowing in the mars etc but now we know that there is nothing like that there is to the best of our knowledge there is no living thing on mars but then if there are some microbial things are there on mars now or earlier it is quietly quite likely that they would have given rise to some methane because on earth 90% of the methane is generated by micro microbes so not only india but all mars missions one of the prime objective is to find out the presence of methane which is as an indirect evidence to see whether there was a life now or even earlier even a million years ago if methane was uh, if microbes were, uh, were there it would have generated some methane which would have got embedded underneath some rock or somewhere and it could have been it could have been an indirect indication there is some indication of parts per billion ranges of methane that is what um, makes people to believe that there would have been some life on earth that was one second one was again we had a camera we had a uh, then mineral uh, resource uh, mineral sourcing like uh, material was there and then these are the major uh, instruments okay next uh, sir shivani is keep on asking uh, what should i start doing as a ninth grade student in order to become an astronaut see i told you from 9 to 10 to 11 to 12 you study well and come out in flying colors in your because why and the study well is needed because unfortunately in our country there is no other mechanism to go to higher studies with 10th class study information you cannot go into a space program so you should have a minimum post graduation in science or a graduation in engineering for which you should get admission so you have to study well and get to do one of these courses but at the same time what you can do is that is a routine thing. what you can do is you sustain your interest i find that you are very much interested you sustain your interest you go on keeping your interest up keep yourself abreast with things try to think think to differently even in ninth standard there are systems you know where nasa and even isro calls for students proposals you can write proposal when you come to the 10th class 
Sir, she want to become astronaut, sir. Not space scientist. Astronaut scientific. means it's a more difficult thing, you know. You should have a physical abilities. You should withstand the microgravity conditions. That means weightlessness and related uh, physical conditions for a longer duration. Then you should have agility. Suppose something happens, everything is pre-planned. Suppose something breaks, then you have to make on the spot decision. Because it takes time for uh, somebody to advise from here to there. You have to do it yourself. So you have, uh, build up your physical ability and your agility. Agility means your ability also you build up. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, next. Yes, sir. Arjun is asking, is traveling to sun is possible? It is not possible. <laughs> because, <clears throat> because the temperature is so high. Lowest temperature on the surface is 6,000 Kelvin. And uh, the, it is uh, close to a uh, 1 lakh Kelvin near in the in the circle around in that. So you can't go near anywhere near sun. Okay. Yes, sir. Roshan's question. What are the measures ISRO is taking for reducing the space pollution? Okay, it's a good question. See, we have the major pollution comes from the propellants. Okay. So we have done a futuristic work. That is, currently we use a chemical called ammonium perchlorate as the oxidizer. That has got a chlorine molecule in that. So we are trying to replace it with a new chemical called ammonium dinitramide for which it was a very new work, for which we got a patent from, from my laboratory only we did, and we got a patent filed in the USA as well as Europe. This, some of these things were included in my CV because of the positive time she has not mentioned. We had a US and uh, American patent to have for this uh, particular work, which, uh, which, uh, which is a futuristic work. So, one ton of propellant may uh, fired creates 320 tons of uh, solid residues and about uh, uh, one one thousand tons. Thousand tons gives 320 tons and uh, all these things. So we are trying to make it. But remember, even though I said like this, remember today the entire amount of rocket exhaust made from all the rockets around the globe is less than is less than five minutes of pollution coming out of automobiles in a country like US. You understood? But still, then you ask why we make all this rocket. I thought somebody will ask that. I believe that you would ask that question and therefore I will answer it. Because our rockets pass through the ozone layer when it goes up. Therefore, we believe that in time to come, there may be a legislation which prevents any chlorine containing compound passing through the ozone layer. That's why we have done an advanced session. Another characteristic of ISRO is that we envisage 20 to 30 to 50 years ahead and do the work. So like that, nobody asked us to make a chlorine-free oxidizer in our laboratory, but we did, thinking that, you know, the future generation may benefit from that. Okay, next. Sir, so Sumedha is asking, uh, from your experience, can you mention one unique thing that ISRO does, but other agencies don't? Yeah, I told you, the most unique thing is, three things I have told you in different parts of my work. One is that, who was the question? Ask the question. Name. Name the person who asked the question. Sumedha. Name of the person. Sumedha. 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 Sumedha, you imagine that you made a mistake. Then your uh, all other guys will say, Are Sumedha, you made a mistake. You are responsible for that. In Israel, we don't do that. In fact, the mistake of Sumedha, the reason for that is found out by somebody else, a high power committee which goes into that. That is a very unique thing. Sumedha makes a new design. I told you about uh, our design review committee. Then, you know, the entire community is with you to check your design and see that it is okay. That is also a unique thing. 
third and fourth which is the most unique thing is that we hundreds work together for a single cause not worrying about what i will get out of that it is incident it will come automatic very few only ask okay what come what uh, i get out of that they work for the cause that is a very unique okay uh, yes sir of course the last one is very unique and uh, navin is asking uh, sir isro is planning for space station there are 99 questions and you have consolidated into one okay very good <laughs> space station of course in time to come we have to have a space station then only we can get you see this gaganyaan etc i will give you an idea of only a couple of days but if you want to establish some habitat in distant places like mars we should simulate that conditions actual conditions for several days together for which if a satellite remains in orbit for a long duration that is called a space station so we will have a space station in time so i suggest that uh, you know i suggest that now it is almost 740 according to my watch so i believe that our uh, achan and others would like to have a break so i i will be available uh, after the zoom meeting for 15 minutes uh, Yes, sir. Is it okay with you? Uh, sir, we have uh, another meeting at eight. Oh, yeah. So that means from now to eight, after the vote of thanks and the benediction, I will be here. So to directly interact with you, I can see you face to face and ask answer your questions as well. Okay. Is it game with you? It's game with me. That's good. Ariman. Respected guests and all dear ones who are attending far and near. I am Ariman Arun, studying in 7th standard from Kairikam International Public School. It is my proud to be a part of this program organized by JMM Study Center. First of all, extend my most sincere thanks to Almighty God for making today's event a resounding success. with his blessings and grace we are able to make this program but it was on behalf of myself i extend a really hearty vote of thanks to dr k n nainan former outstanding scientist bsc our chief guest who spared time to convey his lecture today we had an opportunity to hear his thoughts and this will surely be going to encourage us in our future I also extend my thanks to Reverend B G M Raju and Mr C B Palujira for their prayers and blessings to our program. I am immensely thankful to Dr D T L Shivada, scientist V S C, for her active participation in the question answer session. My sincere gratitude goes to Dr Jameson Achan and all governing council members of J M M Study Center for this beautiful session. I would like to express my sincere thanks to the technical and media wing leading by Mr Robin Thomas and Reverend Ashish Thomas a special thanks to our respected chairman of KIPS Dr Abraham Karikam our loving chairman who makes every child a successful student with a deep sense of appreciation thank our loving teachers staffs and students of Karikam International Public School I am also very grateful to Lia Anna Yohanan who welcome all of us to this program my sincere gratitude goes to all parents and students well wishers for your rock solid support system and encouragement thank you so much for all attending this program thank you thank you again james nation please thank you dr ken nenan sir for your incredible lecture on the incredible space accomplishments of india uh, you ignited us and inspired us with your talk thank you thank you very much and dr deepthi uh, shivadas for your guidance in the first answer session the host of this program on behalf of jmwas karikam international 
public school especially special gratitude to dr abraham karikam sir and all the teachers and the students those who have uh, encouraged in this program our next session will be led by anup tekmutil on the topic exciting nature of the biological process see you next friday 6 evening 6 o'clock so let me thank all of you on behalf of jaimam for your uh, meaningful participation in this program hope to meet you all next week now i request mr cb palichara to conclude the session with prayer thank you achan let's pray lord we thank you for this wonderful session on the rocket science which is very niche and new to us lord thank you for our nine and sir and for using him for his glo- for your glory lord we thank you for all the services we are getting through isro team plus all the scientists and those who are working there lord we pray for all the students who are participating in this event lord give them the ability to think big and give them the confidence to achieve that lord lord we thank you for the jmm particularly to, for our james nachan and all those who are supporting this event lord be with us all through our life and be with us in the upcoming sessions as well in jesus name we pray amen may the grace peace and blessings of the god the creator redeemer and sustainer be with us now and for all more amen, amen. thank you the floor is open now uh, you can continue with the discussions over to nanan sir and deepthi okay but then those who ask question now you can ask questions in person but then be disciplined in the sense that if everybody asks asking questions sir, together can you hear me yeah yeah, yeah. milan okay yes sir i am milan uh, my name is milan sir good evening yeah sir has isro announced any other programs after gegenian you are asking what are the programs after gegenian yes sir no the manned mission we have not announced at any any program after that oh. so first you know it has to be proven in numbers first one will be you know Uh, first one will be again yeah it has to be grown a couple of times then only it will go to the next levels okay okay oh, oh, thank you sir i have my name is femi john i am from matama high secondary school patnam what are the options for greenhouse gas free ro- sorry you are not audible i can't hear you yeah shivani please sir is india going to send astronauts to the moon soon and i have another question as well can we ex- expect a launch on europa jupiter's moon soon No, no, I told you earlier, we are not planning in the near future any launch to me. Or other things will come only after that. Nothing in the immediate future. Okay. Okay, sir. Hello, sir. I'm Nandini. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Is there any way possible... to heal the ozone layer with artificial methods at least to an average extent yeah this is a good question is there any method to heal or what what do you ask yes sir heal heal okay you know the best method to heal is to kill the killer <laughs> okay the killer of ozone layer is what is called chlorofluorohydrocarbon they are mostly found in our refrigerants and also the earlier version of the spray which we use but bulk quantity was from refrigerants huge quantities so people have found out that 
the ozone layer depletion happens because of what is called a free radical reaction that means a reaction which will live for immense time which will not end rocket i told you you see the rocket has got right now polluting gases which are coming out of the propellants so in time to come we are replacing the propellants with what you call the eco friendly uh, propellants like hydrocarbon oxygen system in place of unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine and n2o4 system what we are using right now both of them are toxic materials so they will be replaced with uh, hydrocarbon which is uh, which is uh, harmless which is non toxic and oxygen which is also non toxic then i told you in the in the case of uh, uh, you know another chemical called hydrazine which is used in satellites we are contemplating to replace it with uh, likewise similar uh, non toxic chemicals coming to the greenhouse effect i have told you earlier chlorine containing compounds will be replaced in time to come okay next yes sir thank you sir good evening sir good evening. sir can you hear me yeah yeah of course sir. okay sir i am adit toms studying in 7th grade adventist school standard 9 here kuttapula tiruvalla yeah sir i want to ask you a question that um sir can we go uh, sir, can we go to another planet like uh, jupiter and venus theoretically you can go but then as i told you if your aim is only to observe there you don't have to go. we can send jolly well some instruments and even a robo and then find out there whereas if your aim is to settle down somewhere as i told you earlier the next best to the earth is the mars that is why there is more attention so far as the habitat is concerned in the case of the mars but other planets may give us rare minerals rare materials etc for which we don't have to go we can send a robo or, a, or an instruments to do the mining and so on. okay another 5 minutes we should conclude because i am willing but then there are other programs i also want to make yeah. an announcement there are only about 70 participants but you can pass it on to others who participated also i think there was a suggestion by at least some persons why not have these classes in malayalam okay i am game because i am fluent both in english and malayalam but then all the eight faculty members are not fluent in malayalam second thing is that if uh, uh, you know there are we have uh, students from abroad also who are studying in english medium schools however i want to assure you on behalf of the jmm study center that if 30 or 35 of you come with a specific request to come you are obviously you have come because you, you are listening to this of your friends or somebody near, uh, known to you once you are in malayalam you send a mail to uh, our achan we will consider uh, if there are 30 genuine requests are there at least i will give a class without any problem i will request all my colleagues also to do so okay this is an announcement okay next question sir good evening oh, yeah yeah one one at a time okay first there was a female girl asked what was it okay okay you are here now who can ask Ash- ashmit okay yes right? uh, what will be the future technology of rocket how we are going to improve it further for exploration yeah you know right now our limitation is the thrust generating capacity of uh, the chemical propellants that is one disadvantage there are things like electric propulsion nuclear propulsion and things like that very fancy things but then the main problem with them is that their you know inert mass is so heavy you have to carry a reactor with you to get a nuclear okay 
So miniaturization of that reactor, if you can miniaturize a small one, then obviously we can get uh, four times more efficient propellant than chemical propulsion. Followed, no? Abhijit uh, Smith. Huh? Second thing is that you know, things like small thrusting for a long duration, like electric propulsion, is used for interplanetary mission. From going from a, a, a orbit. Once you are in an orbit, means, that means you are equated with the gravity of the Earth. Thereafter, the thrust requirement for going to distant places is very small. Okay. And it has to be small but sustained if you want to travel for long durations. So, for that, this type of propulsion, like electric propulsion, nuclear propulsion, etc., are used. Yet another method of thinking is that you heat up a gas like helium using any of this method and then make use of the propellant. But there again, the heating device needs so huge uh, contraptions that it becomes again non viable In other words, even though the chemical propellants are classical, till now there is no other better means for overcoming the Earth's gravity than the chemical. Okay. I'm telling it not because I'm a chemical propellant man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, next. I am Milan Abraham Vargis. Yeah. Milan. Can we go to go faster to other planets like Mars with most advanced artificial intelligence in future? Okay, that's a good question. You see, artificial intelligence, etc. will tell you about you, see, you have a lecture at the end of our last class. Yes, I'm sir. not a specialist in that area. However, if you have got a propulsion device, which can go, right now, you know, going to Mars, we don't do any propulsion. Then how do we go? You should immediately ask. <laughs> how do we, we go because we enter into an orbit. See, the rocket or propulsion is made to enter into an orbit, which will take from there to Mars by getting into an orbit around the sun. Okay. Otherwise, if you want to go against gravity to Mars by propulsion alone, it will need such a huge amount of propulsion that you will not reach there. Okay. So okay. if your school is interested, maybe sometime later I will give you a lecture on how we went to Mars. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. Then. Good evening, sir. Good evening. I'm from I'm Umati Wari from the Sotanishan Higher Secondary School. I want to ask for that is artificial intelligence is good for future for the future of the earth. Many of you by artificial intelligence meaning robots. But what is meant by artificial intelligence? You will you please listen to the last class. In other words, you should attend every class. Come to the last class and then you will know what is artificial intelligence. Sir, Robots are uh, essentially uh, used. No, now I think where is our Deepthi? Deepthi, you are here? Yes, sir. I'm here. Uh, is it time to close? Means you have to close. You, you ring up to our. Uh, four more minutes, speaker, sir. Okay, four more minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sir, hello, <laughs> hello, hello, sir. I have a question. That yeah. uh, do we do we have any uh, yearly plan to go like tourism in space? Oh yeah, yeah. good question, good question. See, we, the, pro the problem is that, there again, I will go to uh, Dr. Vikram Sharabai. He gave priority to solving the problem of man and the country rather than doing other things. Definitely, all this can be used for space tourism. But today, you know, one ticket is, uh, how much it was? I read somewhere different uh, versions, five crores, one, one version, another version, 10 crore, and then, uh, you know, that uh, SpaceX one-way ticket is uh, 20 crores. But where is the money for this? There are fancy things like, you know, our own people doing a, their wedding in a submarine. It, <laughs> Instead of a church, some guys have done inside a submarine because they have got a lot of wealth. So they don't know how to do that. But as an organ, if you ask my opinion, as an organization, if space tourism can bring money to the poor, I will vote for that. 
there are cbds for the fancy of some guys i will not work for that we will wait for better times when things become easily travelable like you know certain times the ticket of usa i can go to moon i will maybe my children or grandchildren will go, go not with uh, the current rates but then when we have what is called a recoverable space uh launch vehicles things are expected to be lesser costly and then we can go as somebody said you can have a trip to moon for your wedding rather than <laughs> having you in a in a submarine uh, maybe your your next generation maybe that is possible okay okay i think we are just uh, last minute so one last question if anybody has otherwise i would i would conclude by telling that i thoroughly enjoyed even though it was continuously almost 1 1 one hour 45 minutes talk for me without any stop i thoroughly enjoyed because i could sense your uh, even when you are not visible i could sense by a fifth sense i could sense your enthusiasm and your devotion your questions were all very beautiful questions so you keep it up let god bless you in time to come to become a great scientist if not a scientist good citizens for the country and for your own family and for your own parents thank you very much okay thank you sir once again thank you very much thank you dr deepthi and all those who participated in this program so thank you god bless see you next time bye bye okay bye thank you sir 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 thank you sir, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. okay bye